evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to D.G. Wills Books in La Jolla, California. Tonight we're honored to have documentary filmmaker and music historian Bill Perrine here to discuss, uh, read from and discuss his book, Alien Territory, Radical, Experimental, and Irrelevant Music in 1970s San Diego. Bill Perrine's film documentaries include Children of the Stars, It's Gonna Blow, San Diego Music Underground, 1986-96, to 96, Why Are We Doing This in Front of People, etc. From trailer park punks to Pulitzer Prize winners, this is the untold story of a sleepy Navy town that became the unlikely gathering point for some of the most innovative, unclassifiable American artists of their time. The late 60s arrival of Harry Parch, hobo composer, iconoclast, and inventor of instruments such as the harmonic uh, cannon and, and, quadra, and, and, and quadrangularis reversum, jump-started a revolution that was as much social as it was musical, drawing in on the occult, self-realization, and radical political movements of 70s Southern California. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Perrine. Thank you. All right, I'm going to do this. Thanks everybody for coming out tonight. This is a very, hello, this is a very intimate crowd, so I'm going to approach this intimately. Um, so uh, I used to work here back in the 90s, oddly enough, and um, so this is kind of weird to be up here in a lot of ways because I was here for a lot of readings for a lot of famous people and a lot of not so famous people. Uh, and so now I'm here. So one of, the, one of the things I remember most about this store is I was here when it was built, actually. I helped build it. These floors, I think I, what did I do? Scrape off the old tile or something like that? That's when Bill was barefoot and the carpenters referred to him as Barefoot Bill. Well, when I scraped off these tiles, Dennis laid down this beautiful hardwood floor. This was about 30 years ago. And the thing I really remember him doing is right after the, the floor was laid down and it was beautiful and probably cost a shit ton of money, I assume, the first thing Dennis did is he stood here with his beer, his Paps Blue Ribbon, and he poured it all over the, all over the floor and he said, we got to season this thing, it's too nice. And so, and now there's a giant divot where I'm sitting because it's 30 years of people sitting on their asses right here. So if that... If there's a connection between that little anecdote and the way I'm going to pursue this stuff tonight, uh, you can make that in your own mind. Or if there's any connection between the way some of this music is constructed and that anecdote, you can also maybe make some connections there. Um, but basically, hopefully, the we're having some tech issues here, but hopefully this is going to work in some way. Um, all I'm going to do is I'm going to play some stuff the other talks I've done for this have really been focused more on like the social aspects and the historical aspects um, of the book. And this time, just to keep it hopefully interesting, it's gonna be more on the music itself. And so I'm going to be guided by this um, playlist that I made for The Quietus. It's a British, uh, a British online magazine, but I'm also gonna kinda wing it a bit and uh, you know, talk a bit. But, you know, this is such a, a small, uh, intimate crowd that I think uh, I'd like people to just speak up if anybody has any questions or anyone wants to say anything or complain or whatever you want to do, uh, please. And there are some people in the audience who I suspect know, maybe know some things that I don't about this stuff. Uh, so, you know, let it rip, anybody who wants to say anything. We have some sound, all right. So, uh, I'm gonna start with uh, Paulino Oliveros. So the story of San Diego's experimental music scene in the 70s arguably starts decades earlier and hundreds of miles away with hobo composer Harry Parch and his rugged handmade take on microtonal music. Uh, Parch didn't actually arrive here in San Diego until the late 60s, but his spirit seemed to linger there long after his passing. Um, but I'm going to start with Oliveros because she was here the entire time. Parch died, I think, around 1973, but uh, Oliveros got here in late 67. She left in 82. Those last couple of years, she wasn't really around at all. So it pretty much kind of aligns with the period that we're covering in this book. So what we're hearing right now is something that she did when she was in the Bay Area. Uh, she was from 
Texas originally, and she was a working class girl from Latina stock, and she played the accordion. She made her way to San Francisco, um, where she got involved with the, the Tate Music Center. She basically founded the Tate Music Center in San Francisco, which is a real kind of DIY thing that later got subsumed into Mills College. And because of that, she ended up in academia in a weird way. And she was very much not an, an ac academic person. So this piece we're listening to right now is called Alien Bog. And it's inspired by the sound of frogs outside of her office window at Mills. So it's her taking the sound of the environment, which Oliveros was very attuned to, and turning it into electronic music. I'm just gonna let this play for a second here. Let me skip, this is about a 30 minute track. Let me skip halfway through and hear what it sounds like. All right, so the bog is in full effect. It's a full alien bog now. So this is what she was doing before she came to San Diego. And she ended up getting a job offer from her former professor, uh, Robert Erickson, who was founding the UCSD music department, who said, come on down, you can have a job in academia. And so Oliveros thought she'd come down for a few years, you know, and get some money, and she ended up staying for a long time. Uh, but by 1969, this is the kind of music she was making here in San Diego. So this is basically noise for about half an hour. It's called a little noise in the system. And it's basically, she had a, a stake in her little tape loop set up and she exploited it and she made this piece of music out of it. But it's almost, it's an almost unbearable piece of music. And everything she did in San Diego around this time kind of sounds like this. And what was happening is that when she made it to San Diego, it was very different from what she had in the Bay Area in a lot of ways. It was a much more conservative environment. Um, than in San Francisco. But there was also a lot going on uh, politically, which feeds into one of the, the themes of the book, which is that around 1970, in the late 60s, things were kind of really going to shit. And San Diego, the campus, which was a very hippie place at the time, was really subsumed by violence. There was a guy who lit himself on fire on campus as a protest against the Vietnam War about 50 feet from where Oliveros was at the time, uh, died, of course, and, um, and she was feeling it. So what she was doing when she was doing these pieces, these, these solo harsh noise pieces, is it was kind of a response to fear and trauma. Um, but she realized at some point that she couldn't keep doing that, and it, it sort of gave her a, a spiritual rebirth. And so she stopped working with tape machines, largely, which had been her main her main point of attention. And she picked up her accordion again, which was about the most uncool instrument you could imagine in, in the late 60s, early 70s, in any context, really. Um, and she retuned herself. What she did is she started playing the, an A note, and she played that A note for about three months on the accordion, just, just a simple A, and then she started harmonizing with it. She would sing with it until she knew sort of every little uh, nuance of the note and eventually she ended up going through all the notes to do that and she retrained herself and she her music was really never the same way uh, again and this was a social this was a social act as much as a musical one and so she what, what she was trying to do and what a lot of people in this book are trying to do is they were trying to explode the idea of what music is particularly Western music particularly you know, quote unquote classical music. And it was trying to make it more egalitarian. It was trying to make it more um, open to chance, open to life. Uh, it was trying to engage with the things that were going on in the culture. And especially on the West Coast or in San Diego, which was sort of the Wild West at the time, it was, you know, well away from the kind of, uh, you know, the high art worlds of the, the East Coast, they were able to do that. And so things got pretty wild. People, you know, she started uh, experimenting with uh, ESP compositions, you know, transmitting sound uh, through ESP. Uh, she started doing these sort of ritual things and on and on. 
So we'll come back to her in a little bit and see where she's gone after this kind of stuff, the Vietnam pieces. So we're gonna skip a little bit head to Harry Parch. And for those who don't know, Harry Parch was uh, a hobo composer who made his own instruments. He had his own scales that he derived from his own studies of uh, Greek and uh, Asian musics. Um, he made these wild instruments that were really pieces of sculpture in a lot of ways. He had this idea of corporeality, which is again tying into what Oliveros was doing. He was, she was, he was trying to get away from this idea of music as being a purely intellectual exercise, which is what was happening a lot, especially in academia. And so corporeality was throwing your body into it. Um, but he was also trying to open it up to the American vernacular. And so here's a really early Parch piece called The Letter. This is from, I don't have the date on it, I think it's around 46. And this is a hobo poem set to music with Parch's own accompaniment. Cincinnati, Ohio, October 2nd, 1935. Hello, pal. And Parch was a true do-it-yourself artist. He, he released his own records. He occasionally, you know, got some money out of benefactors and universities would have him around for a little while until he would get mad and move on. And by the time he got to San Diego, he was basically old and he was infirm. And with the help of Betty Freeman, who was a wealthy uh, uh, patron of, hers, of his, um, he got a job in San Diego at the new UCSD music department. It didn't last very long because he really wasn't uh, meant for that kind of environment. But what he did inspired a whole world of people who are still around today. Uh, and here's really the only piece that he composed and put together in San Diego. It's called The Dreamer That Remains. It's basically his last work. Uh, and it's also a film, but this is the, the music. So this is the whole Parch Ensemble, which was basically a bunch of young hippies who really loved Harry Parch and would do anything for him. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit just so you can hear. This is sort of a sectional piece. So Parch was also, it should be noted, he was gay, just like Oliveros was. Uh, which automatically made him something of an outsider at the time. Uh, and like Oliveros, he was not shy about it. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit now to Robert Erickson, who was one of the founders of the UCSD music department. And Erickson's another fascinating guy. And just like Parch, he made his own instruments. Uh, but unlike Parch, he also composed kind of more traditional music. But I'm going to play something really odd that he did called General Speech. <laughs> So in case you didn't guess, this is a transcription for trombone of a speech by General MacArthur. <laughs> so he's essentially mocking MacArthur. But this was a theater piece. Like a lot of things in this, uh, in this period, people had theatrical elements to it. The Dream of the Remains was a film with all kinds of you know, wacky goings-ons and performances. Uh, general speech involved a guy, a trombonist, dressed up as General MacArthur in a full general's uniform with his trombone, and he's playing a transcription of this speech, mocking MacArthur. Uh, and it even had little, it's such a, a fine transcription that there are pauses where he drinks water and he coughs. Um, and so it was a theatrical piece that he would present. Uh, and his wife, uh, who was a costume designer, did the, the costumes. The thing about Erickson is that he was a founder of the UCSD Music Department, but he hated academia. He loathed it. And so when he started it, he did everything he could to sort of undermine the idea of academia. He didn't want grades. He wanted students and, and teachers to work side by side. Um, he wanted everybody to be sort of on an equal footing, which is why he hired people like Oliveros, who didn't have academic backgrounds. Now, eventually this, eventually this failed, but for the first, I don't know, five to 10 years, uh, some really crazy stuff happened because of this vision. 
going to skip ahead a little bit to the middle of this piece, just so you can hear it. So it's sort of a tone poem, I guess you could say. Our next victim here is one of the people I'm really fascinated by. And this is Kenneth Gaburo. Take a listen to this. I'm just gonna skip to the middle of this. It's 23 minutes long. I'll read my little spiel here. A difficult, contradictory, and undervalued figure. He's an extremely difficult figure. Kenneth Gaburo shared some of his friend Pauline Oliveros' interest in music as a collectively organized social structure. Yet he also had Parch's headstrong my way or the highway temperament. This resulted in some fascinating, fr frustrating exercises in what he liked to call irrelevant music. Much of it performed by his new music choral ensemble, which is what we're listening to right now. Various variations of this new music choral ensemble were focused on mime and on theater. They didn't sing at all. Uh, but this one is all actual singing. So this 1974 drone piece is practically easy listening by his standards, but once you contemplate the ramifications of its construction, three human voices holding a single unwavering tone for 23 minutes, it no longer seems so easy. So what he's doing is he's creating a social structure where these three people have to stay totally on pitch and they have to help each other the whole time because if one person wavers at all, the other person, the other people have to kind of come in and cover a little bit. And so he worked on this for, I think it was like six months. Imagine coming in and performing this every, you know, twice a week, three times a week, whatever they were doing. And that's it. It goes for 23 minutes. And so you can approach it as a drone piece, but if you choose to look behind what the sound is, it's really kind of a remarkable feat. And these people did a lot of things like this. One of his last pieces at UCSD, was called My 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 What a Wonderful Fall and that was the more mime-centric version of this uh, choral ensemble. It involves four people I believe on a 12 by 12 mat and they're doing rolls. They're just rolling around while Oliveros, or not Oliveros, while Gaburo reads a poem over the top and then the sound of them tumbling uh, is amplified throughout the auditorium. But again, the focus is on them tumbling around each other without hitting each other for, it's like 15 minutes. It's, it makes me nauseous to watch it, in all honesty. There's a terrible YouTube clip, clip of it. But again, this is what Gaburo would get into, is he was very interested in these ideas of music as being uh, an art, as being some sort of system and one that had applications in real life. Here's a really crazy one. Uh, I, meant to bring the record. It's called Maladetto, which is a concept record about the history and meaning of the word screw. The idea of the screw. Let me just go to the middle of it. Meaning pug! <laughs> With a bird of shell quite screwed into it. Meaning rah! Ah, what in? Meaning cut! To screwing. Meaning ah! Uh, Patterns. Meaning s! From the mold. Gold! Meaning all! Oh, meaning oh. It's borderline unlistenable, depending on your mo mood or it's fascinating. Once you get into it, it's a really strange record and it's based on his idea of compositional linguistics, which would take another hour to explain. But Gaburo is a really fascinating guy. He's another guy who basically um, was self-defeating in almost every way because of his intense ethical focus. He had to do things in a way that he felt was right. And so he eventually left UCSD where he had a very cushy job he left his house, which was up on La Jolla Scenic Drive, um, and he moved to City Heights, and he started a publishing house, which pub published utterly esoteric scores, and he basically drove himself into bankruptcy. But he did it all his way, and that was sort of the, uh, that was sort of the, the magic of Gaburo, is he never did anything other than his way. Uh, let me play a little bit of side B in Malibu. Oh, you know. and if there was like a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little a little something mellower. This is Prima Materia, which was a weird hippie vocal ensemble that used to practice at the U... What was the name of that bookstore that was down La Jolla Boulevard? The Unicorn, which was a hippie bookstore where people like Warhol and those people would come and show films. Uh, and these guys would do their overtone singing. Alright, let's get into 
some electronic, actual electronic music. This is called La Jolla Good Friday, 1975. On Good Friday, they recorded this. A guy named Thorkel Sigurbjörnsson, who was from Iceland, came here for three weeks. Um, it's credited to him, but it was really a collaboration with a guy named Warren Burt, who was the kind of the foremost electronics whiz kid around San Diego at the time. So this uses a hybrid four system interfacing between a microcomputer and a surge synthesizer. So this recording ended up being issued by the CP2 label, which was a big New York label at the time for uh, kind of progressive music. And this sounds nothing like anything else Sigurd Bjornsson ever did. He was a very traditional composer. And he described basically coming here and feeling so terminally jet-lagged and culture-shocked by how weird California was in the 70s compared to Reykjavik that he sort of ascribed this to his own, like a bout of madness almost. But it's a great record, actually. Really good record. If you like this kind of stuff. So nowadays, this kind of stuff you could probably do on your laptop, but this was a big deal back then. Uh, so here's David Dunn. David Dunn's another fascinating guy. He was one of Parch's people. But David got very influenced by the land art movement in the 70s, where uh, people would you know, go out to the desert and with a, with a bulldozer and cut a trench, and that would be art. You know, They were basically molding the land. But David wanted to do something where he wouldn't cause any harm to the land, and he wanted to work with sound. So he started doing these site-specific pieces. He would go out and, uh, you know, like this one is from the Grand Canyon. And initially the idea was to bring these, these trumpet players, I believe, and play in the echoes of the Grand Canyon. Um, they also did this out in Borrego and some other places. But what happened is that the, the birds started interacting with the sound, and it became a duet with the birds. And so this is just a, a field recording, so it's not exactly pristine, but um, it's very interesting. So David later did this with uh, Warren Burt and some other people. They did a, a, a version in downtown San Diego with these giant speakers blasting synthesizer loops. And they, they blasted it down Broadway. Uh, and so it would bounce off the giant buildings on Broadway, on Broadway. And people would come out and hang out of their windows until the cops eventually chased them off. Um, so the, the humans weren't quite as interesting as the birds. Um, the other thing that David did, he was part of a group called Fatty Acid with Warren and a guy named Ron Raboy. And their deal, which sort of came from Parch in a way, is they were very accomplished musicians. Ron still plays, I believe, with the San Diego Symphony. Um, they would play instruments they didn't know how to play. And then they would play classical music that they loathed kind of the cheesier end of the classical spectrum. Here's a recording they did at some concert. They did these real comedy routines in between sometimes, but we'll skip into the, like they do Wagner. Wagner was a big one they picked on. So the idea was to play it as sincerely as you could, despite not knowing how to play your instrument. And so they'd come across these moments of real odd beauty, and then moments of high comedy. <laughs> Every once in a while you can hear the audience kind of lose it. Anyway, they did this and they ended up playing a piece by Ernest Krennic one time, who was uh, a mentor of several people in UCSD. And half the crowd walked out because they were so insulted that they were taking down Ernst Krennic. Let's see if I can find a particularly juicy part. 
when they do Chinese work songs. So this was a whole movement, actually, of people playing music badly. There was the Portsmouth Sinf Sinfonia, who were in London, who were doing this kind of thing, and were a real sensation. They filled Royal Albert Hall one time, playing um, bad versions of classical music. And again, it was part of the sort of do-it-yourself ethos. The idea was that anybody could play this stuff. And it was a real, you know, fuck you, basically, to the establishment is what it was. Brian Eno was involved with them. So here's Wilburn Burchette, who just died recently, a couple months ago. Wilburn was a mail order mystic. He used to I issue these, these recordings on LP, complete with instructions, via mail order to help you find your third eye. He did about six or seven of these, I think, if I remember right. But the amazing thing is a lot of them feature these uh, pretty state-of-the-art electronics, uh, which, you know, unfortunately no one ever really got to have a proper conversation with Burchette. He was a very eccentric guy, I think. So no one's quite sure how he did this. He had no contact with really anybody else in San Diego when he was doing this stuff. And some of it's quite good. He also made his own guitar, the Impro guitar, which was part of his Impro system, which I've yet to crack what the system is exactly, but it was a system of some kind. So this was originally called Eat Shit Fatherfucker. They later, he later renamed it Macho Music. And this was another fuck you to a lot of people. He was basically almost kicked out of school, I think, for writing this piece. Okay, another guy who was doing stuff kind of like this, a little bit later, is uh, Paul Drescher, who used to, uh, he made his own looping system, basically, for his electric guitar. This would be about 78, so it's considerably later, but still was equally kind of uncool at the time around here. And he was doing something similar to maybe what Robert Fripp was doing, except uh, it's, he's less into building these sort of ambient tones and more into kind of repetition of patterns. But again, the, he, he built this entire system. It's not like a pedal. Nowadays, you could just do this with a pedal, one little pedal. Uh, he built this, and again, it comes out of that Harry Parch thing. He was another admirer of Parch and uh, uh, this crowd of people around Parch. Let's see if I can get this here. So this is called Liquid and Stellar Music. It's about a 20-minute 20, 20 piece or so. And again, it's him playing these very simple lines on the guitar, but he's running it through this, this looping system that he's done uh, so he could do it on the fly. And this was recorded, I think, in El Cajon, if I remember right, at a little studio there. And Drescher's uh, still around, and he's kind of a big, a big guy on the kind of new classical circuit. And I think he still plays guitar. He used to play in a white suit, kind of like Steve Martin, and he had a white guitar. This is called Lonesome Echo. This is from, I don't know, around 77, I would guess. This is just a guy basically in, he was probably in Normal Heights at the time. He had a little apartment there doing this in his, in his bedroom and it's great. working entirely with loops basically here and he introduces little variations and things as it goes on but Robert was basically he was part of a crew with amongst others Boyd Rice who went on to some infamy uh, and Steve Hitchcock and now Steve Hitchcock had a little magazine called Cabaret Voltaire 
which was a mail art zine. Back then, mail art was this thing where you would kind of, um, people would publish their, their address in the magazine and they would mail art to each other for free. And it was a way of kind of creating these, again, uh, sort of bypassing the typical art scene. And so like uh, Cabri Voltaire, you know, the, there, were, there were people in England who were involved with it in the Netherlands. Uh, Patti Smith in New York was part of it. Her address is in there. Um, Captain Beefheart was part of it. Uh, and so Hitchcock was running this out of his apartment by San Diego State. He was just a college kid uh, and a punk rocker, basically. So they were all really into Dada, all these guys. And Boyd Rice ended up becoming quite well known, whereas Robert is still making music and still doing very well, but he's a, a quieter personality. And he's only now, I think, kind of getting more recognition. But it's really great stuff. I'll play a little bit of Boyd's stuff. This is Boyd's uh, Black Album, which can be played at any speed. You can play it at 16, 33, 78, or whatever your turntable would do. Most of the tracks were, I believe, one minute long, and they're mostly composed in these really primitive loops. Here's one. So this album was a sensation. It ended up going to England. Partly, I think, because of the way it was presented. It was entirely in a black sleeve. The fact that it said you could play it at any speed really uh, tickled people's fancy. And I think it was this record, or it might have been another one. He had this habit of he would drill multiple holes in the record so that you could play it off axis. axis. Um, so the idea, again, was to undermine the entire idea of an album as being some sort of statement of like artistic intent you could do kind of anything you wanted with it it could sound however you wanted um, and again he's mostly working with he was a big fan of like girl groups and things like that he had a real love of tiki culture so he would get these kind of cheesy old records i say that lovingly often and then he would do these loops with them but who knows what he's doing at any given time and Boyd, bless his heart, is such an egomaniac. He claims never to have heard Brian Eno or Lou Reed, who are all doing stuff kind of like this. Uh, John Cage did stuff like this back in the 60s, but you know, Boyd would never admit that. He, he invented this. Maybe he did. Here's the thing he did with uh, Robert Terman. They had a band called Non, which eventually became a Boyd Rice solo project. But Non used to play with all the punk bands here and in LA, and, but they were completely abstract or almost completely abstract. And they were designed to basically make you leave the room. That was the idea. That's called Knife Ladder. And so they would play with like much more traditional rock bands. And according to Robert, they had really mixed reception. Sometimes people loved it. Um, he described one time when I think he described people just throwing themselves into a pile and like um, having seizures almost. They were because the, they would just play as loud as they could. And then other times, you know, they'd spit on them and walk out the door. But I think either one was kind of considered okay. So here's a little something by Diamanda Galas and Jim French. Now, Diamanda. Let me give a little spiel about Diamanda. So even Diamanda Galas has a hard time convincing people she's from San Diego. Yet much of her art and persona were shaped in the sunny beach town not far from the Mexican border. Her father was a conservative Greek who taught his young daughter that singing was for whores. Yet he had no problem dragging her through the seedy underbelly of the town from bar to bowling alley as the piano player in his band. While a teenager, she appeared as a piano soloist with the local symphony, but she really came into her own when she started exploring her voice, most often in the city's free improv community. Mark Dresser and Dave Millard were frequent partners Perhaps her most frequent foil was the volatile and under-recorded Jim French, who fused fire-breathing sax work with the instrument building and microtonal legacy of Harry Parch. So basically, before Diamanda Galas became Diamanda Galas, she was not only playing Carpenter's covers in bowling alleys around town with her father, she was gigging as a free improv person. And for a long time, she really only played piano. She didn't sing. 
because her father told her that, you know, only whores were singers, uh, which apparently he meant. So eventually she started exploring her voice. Uh, she would take LSD and go into uh, an anechoic chambers and practice that way, which might tell you something about where her vocal work came from. Uh, but here's some of her sort of under-recorded free improv work with Jim French, who was quite a character, a real lovable lunatic, mostly lovable. <laughs> Diamanda hates this record, just for the record. So at the end of this record, which I guess was a really tumultuous recording experience, Diamanda didn't want to do it. Jim was unhappy with a lot of things. Uh, and Jim and Diamanda had been dating, and they were about to break mm. up. At the end of one of these songs, you can just hear her screaming his name over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> which apparently was a sign of some discord. It's not that one. Now, left to his own devices, Jim was a real lover of homemade instruments and um, history, particularly, how do I put this, ethnic history? Uh, people's, um, he's really into genealogy and where people came from and what that might mean. Uh, and he was into the Viking ways. He was a pra pract practicing Viking, probably still is. Uh, but he devoted half of this record, or almost half of this record, to him playing on these traditional instruments that he had made, which was another kind of career suicide move, to do something like this in the late 70s, like on a free improv record. This is called Pib Corponia, and it's a pib corn, some sort of ancient Welsh instrument that he built. And uh, yeah, this opens the record, his big recording debut and Demanda's first record. <laughs> So my theory, I've never been able to kind of run this by Jim because Jim's not exactly a linear talker, but I think he starts the record out with this bit of ancient kind of mythology almost, and he ends it with the kind of typical, not typical, but more common kind of fire-breathing Anthony Braxton, Evan Parker kind of sax pyrotechnics. And so I think he's giving a little like I think he's giving a lecture essentially that these musics are all the same is kind of my theory on that. But all people really got from it was they were just baffled, I think. There's a, a review by Eugene Chadbourne who just said, who was just baffled about why a record would have had this on it. <laughs> and it's only about a minute long, by the way. He did a bunch of these, like five little one minute things and then a long kind of fire breathing sax thing. Um, so after all that, uh, Diamanda eventually discovered really the power of her voice and she discovered electronics, which is really a big part of her sound, especially at that period. Uh, and she became a sensation after a decade of kind of gigging around town. This is Litanies of Satan, which was kind of her big breakout. You can hear where she came from and where she's going, I think, on this. So the lyrics are from Baudelaire. Oh, 
But what she's doing, I believe, I have to double check this with her, but I believe she did this essentially live. She would run her voice through, she would have multiple microphones and run her voice through very ele various electronic treatments. And so when you hear that sort of what it opened with, I believe she would do that live. Here's a little something to go back a bit. I talked about some of the Parch people. There was a whole crew um, after Parch died. Following Harry Parch's death, a ragtag group of microtonally obsessed tinkerers, math freaks, instrument builders, and theorists from around the world banded together around Jonathan Glazier's San Diego-based Interval magazine. Jonathan was one of uh, Parch's people, played with Parch for, for a number of years and knew him very well. They agreed on just enough to keep the community together, yet were fractious enough to resist, resist orthodoxy. Few thought of themselves as recording artists, and thus oral evidence of their work is somewhat slim. Now, Confluence, which I'm about to play, is one of the few that we have really kind of a good, decent recording of. Uh, they grew out of something that Jonathan Glazier did called the Id Project, which combined homemade instruments with names like Godzilla with an inclusive anyone can do this ethos. Now, the Id Project would play in Balboa Park and invite, invite passers by to join them, often seating the stage entirely to the amateurs. So people would walk by, they would see these homemade instruments, Jonathan and co. would hand them to the people, they'd start playing along, and eventually Jonathan and everybody else would kind of go and watch the amateurs do it. And so, again, this is sort of taking the, these parch ideas and these ideas of egalitarianism to an extreme. Uh, but Confluence was a break off from that. They kept the homemade instruments, they kept the improvisation, um, but they placed a little more emphasis on actual on results, I guess you could say. They wanted to be a little bit more professional, and so they would play somewhat more traditional venues and play uh, a little bit more, not a little bit, they're all very accomplished musicians. They would play more professionally. Uh, this is an archive recording. It just It's called Zoo Story, I don't know why, and I'm not even sure, let's see what happens. So there's a picture in the book of some of the, the instruments that they used. And again, they come from this parch tradition of these really like sculptural instruments. A lot of them are made from, you know, oil drums and things like that, but they're all very strangely beautiful. And so when they're all laid out, it's a real sight. And as with a lot of this music, it was really designed as an experience that you would be in the room with it and watch it unfold and be part of it. And so Confluence and a lot of these guys never issued official recordings because they just didn't see themselves that way. So we started with Oliveros, and I'm going to go back to Oliveros here real quick. So during the time between this first piece, which I'm going to regale you with again, a little noise in the system, the pure noise piece, over the next 10 years she sort of tried everything under the sun. She played in a klezmer band for a while in drag. She called herself Dr. Dr. Alinsky, I believe. Uh, and she would wear a beard and she would play her accordion with a klezmer band. Uh, she did things like she had a, uh, for a dollar you could buy a composition for her. She'd set up a booth and you could just walk up and give her a dollar and she'd write you a composition. Uh, she did experiments with ESP. She did experiments with uh, the mandala was sort of an organizing principle. She worked with everything from 30 strong uh, symphony orchestras to solo accordion work and was a remarkable influence on kind of everyone who came across her. She was a very, by all accounts, a very open-minded and kind person uh, and also a very smart one. Uh, one of the funny, one of the, my favorite stories about her is late in her career when she was probably in her 70s. She was in Buenos Aires playing a, I think a museum and at some point she realized that these two guys had walked in and they were bootlegging her performance. They had set up like a little recording, a little uh, tape player right in front of her. And she thought, okay, well that's kind of weird. And then she got home, uh, she was living in New York at the time, upstate New York, and she got this tape in the mail and the people who had recorded it had added their own music to it and turned it into this sort of noise piece. And she thought, okay, well that takes some balls. So she contacted them and she found out amongst other things, that their drummer had Down syndrome. 
and that the two other people in the band with him, which was called Reynolds, were essentially his, uh, they had taught him at a school and they had formed a band together and they had been recording uh, voluminously for years. And Oliveros was just delighted by this, what they had done to her recording. And so they basically defaced it. And she not only got it issued, she ended up collaborating with them on, I think, two or three more albums. And by that point, she was this kind of, you know, uh, globe-trotting, if there's a superstar in the experimental music world, she was that. Um, but as far as her San Diego years go, she spent a lot of it developing this piece that eventually became Horse Sings from Cloud. And it all comes from that whole working with a single note thing that she did around 1969, 1970, where she just played A. Uh, and she played this over and over again in various ways until it came out on her first record, her first sort of record of her own in 1982. And this is Horse Sings from Cloud. It's about 20 minutes long. I'll just play a little bit of it. this goes on, the, the idea behind this piece, it was based on her concept of de deep listening and sonic meditations. It was all about paying attention to your environment and paying attention to, very close attention to what you were hearing, every nuance. But essentially all she did with this is based on her breath. She would play an accordion tone for as long as she wanted until her breath kind of changed and then she would change it and she would sing with it, and it develops and becomes a very meditative piece, and it's one of the most influential pieces of music of the last 50 years, I would say. This is a piece that if you if you listen to this and you really just allow yourself to if you give yourself up to it and really practice what well you can do two things one is you can practice what Oliveros suggests which is actual deep listening to really listen to every little tone that's here uh, it can have a really strangely transportive effect or you can turn it down really low and it's just kind of ambient music whatever you like but it's the, it's the basis of her entire music essentially going forward after 1982 until her death about five years ago. And it's the basis of a whole genre of music that's devoted to this. And she's become sort of, even since her death, she's become more and more an impor important figure in this world. And that's it.
Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. <laughs>